Good morning. It's David again. And here I am in my cozy little apartment in Rockland, Idaho, with my good friends who became my good friends uh, via the internet. They've been watching my videos, watching my journey for more than a year now. Uh, Jim and Debbie Yunkin. So say hello, Jim and Debbie. Hi. Hi. Yeah, so hello. It's Jim and Debbie for the first time. And uh, the reason for this video, I'm trying to think what to call this video. How about who is David <laughs> Alexander? Really? <laughs> who is he really? <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, I haven't really laid out in great detail uh, my past because it's... I, I've summed it up, I think, in probably dozens of my videos. <laughs> well, I've just been, I've failed at everything. It's, <laughs> you know, everything that really mattered, I've failed at, except seeking first the kingdom of God until I found it. That That's basically been my summary of my life. I've dropped a few little details here about my evangelical journey. I've mentioned that I was a pastor three different times over a period of about totaling maybe 10 or 11 years uh, I have mentioned, although some people say I haven't, I have mentioned that I was in a group called the 12 Tribes Communities that was initially um, uh, part of the Jesus Movement, the Vine House in Chattanooga, and then became the Northeast Kingdom Community Church up in Vermont. And then when they realized that they should gather Israel and restore the 12 tribes, as it says in Acts what is it, 1347 and Isaiah 49.6, they changed their name to the 12 tribes, but their roots were in evangelical Christianity. So I've mentioned that. I've mentioned a few things, but I've never given a cohesive story. And um, one of the reasons for that is simply that um, it's, I found a new life, a new start, and a new heart when I actually found the true church where instead of getting baptized and just getting wet, I could actually get baptized and and become a new creature in Christ, actually come into the city that has foundations with something solid to stand on and start a brand new life where I was actually part of the people of God. And uh, and Paul specifically says in, in um, what is it, in Philippians chapter 3, he says, this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forth to what lies ahead, I press towards the mark of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And uh, that's what I've been doing all my life. I've been forgetting what lies behind because it wasn't worth wallowing in and pressing on trying to find the kingdom of God on earth. And now that I've found it, of course, of course, I'm going to press on into the kingdom. So, so what year were you actually born again? Or what year did you actually start into the born again movement? Yeah, well, that that's a good question. And, and thank you for interrupting my, my uh, monologue. <laughs> because the reason for Debbie and Jim here is to kind of just as sincere saints and friends that want to kind of pull me through the story, uh, they're going to ask questions like Jim just did, and then I'm going to answer them. And that's so basically, they're going to make sure the whole story gets told in all of its gory detail. <laughs> all right. So anyway, when did I first get into the evangelical Christian thing? That's actually an interesting story, because it turns it from a 47 year journey to a 52 year journey. Uh the 47 year version started when I was 21. Right. But actually, when I was 16 years old, my first exposure to non Catholic Christianity was I was a I was a hippie punk wastrel. Let's see, 16 years old, that would have been like 1970, 71. And I'm driving around in my car with two friends on a Friday night and I, I don't mean to be gory or offend anybody, but the 60s and 70s for me was a time to party and take drugs and do things that don't shouldn't be talked about. And this was one of those nights I'm driving around, I'm stoned out of my mind on mescaline. Uh, so are my friends. And we're, we're driving around in a car, stoned out of our minds on mescaline, <laughs> and drinking wine 
getting drunk on wine and and high on psychedelics and we're bored <laughs> if you can you have to be pretty what can i say you have to be pretty dull to I, I hate to interrupt you but uh me and debbie were doing that same thing about that same year so. I, I know that's one of the reasons the definite I'm, 60s yeah, <laughs> yeah okay. so yeah. I, i'm glad i'm glad that we're 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 all kind of slightly hippie letter and i still have my ponytail okay empathetic so, you're empathetic so you got your fu, fu man chew and you just shaved off your full beard yeah debbie has not had a full beard thank god <laughs> uh but in any case in any case mescaline and wine mescaline and wine driving the car around looking for something to do and nothing's happening we don't know of a party to go to and i see this i see this poster was this in, a, in Olympia? This was in Olympia, Washington. Yeah. I see this poster stapled uh, to a telephone pole. And we pull over and look at it. And it says, Holy Ghost Revival, all welcome. You know, it, Jesus is the Lord. And it was a, a revival, a series of revival meetings that were being put on by the local Assemblies of God Church. At uh, the First Assemblies of God Church, they'd rented... The auditorium at Saint Martin's Auditor uh, Saint Martin's College out in Lacey, and that's where it was. And we we were like, "Let's go laugh at the Holy Rollers." <laughs> and so we turn the car around and we drive out to Lacey, you know, twenty minutes away, and park in the parking lot and go into this auditorium. And I mean, there's quite a few people there. I don't remember exactly. I don't know three or four hundred. Oh, maybe maybe two hundred. And we sit down. We were there for only one reason, which was to mock. I mean, I had been raised in a devout Catholic family. And if my mom had seen me in that condition going there to mock, she would have boxed my ears. But good and good honor. You know, <laughs> she would have she would have grabbed me by the ear and dragged me out of that place. And, you know, but uh, we sat down in the bleachers. It's just I'm in the middle, one friend on one side, one friend on the other side. And um, the preacher's up there. And we're just, ah, you know, just just mocking. We're just there to mock. That's the only reason we're there, just for something to do and to mock and um, and to scorn what's going on. And this preacher's up there, and he starts talking about the agony of Jesus Christ in what he went through, basically talking about the passion from the gospel of John, about everything Jesus went through in the garden, everything, the scourging, you know, the crown of thorns, carrying the cross. And, uh, you know, they, this is actually like familiar territory to me because part of being, being raised in a devout Catholic family is this thing called the stations of the cross. And it says the Stations of the Cross, but it's only like the last one that's actually the cross. The Stations of the Cross starts in the garden with the sweating of the blood and, you know, just all of this stuff. And it's all called the Stations of the Cross. But uh, I'd heard this stuff, Christ died for my sins, but it had never touched my heart in a deep, I, I was like, what is this about? I don't get it. But somehow... I'm stoned on mescaline. I'm half drunk on wine. I'm sitting there mocking. And he starts talking about Jesus shedding his blood for me. And, you know, that my sins crucified my savior and, you, you know, the agony. And all of a sudden I'm like, I'm just like, just like what? And I just felt, I just felt so unclean. I just felt filthy, absolutely filthy. I was like, and I'm just like, it's like I'm seeing Jesus dying for my sins, man. I, I'm seeing Jesus dying for my sins. And I'm just like, it's like I'm like a bug pinned to the wall. I'm just like, and all all I know, the, the, this preacher's up there and he says, if you know you need Jesus, raise your hand. And I'm like, you know, and my friends are like, what are you doing, man? What are you doing? And I'm like, I don't know, man. I just need Jesus. I know I need Jesus. I need Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> you know can you imagine this 16 years old i don't feel stoned anymore all i know is i'm filthy and i need jesus i need to be forgiven and and he says okay if you raise your hand 
run up to the stage. <laughs> I jumped up and I ran up to the stage, you know, with, I don't know, maybe 15 other people. And I'm just crying like a baby. I'm like, oh God. <laughs> because, I mean, I had been, I had spent like the previous, like three years from like 13 to 16, just, just being a vile idiot, you know? And I was carrying a burden of guilt that I didn't even really understand until the proclamation of the atonement brought it to the surface. And uh, and then the pastor, he said, okay, now pray this prayer. And I, I, and he leads us all in the sinner's prayer. And I, I asked Jesus to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And uh, I, I mean, I was as sincere as a human being can be. I, I was like just brokenhearted over what a wretch I was and how much I needed to be forgiven, and had actually seen that, that Jesus had actually died for my sins. And so, you know, the, then then it got a little bit strange. He says, okay, you prayed that prayer? Now come around behind the stage. <laughs> and so I go around behind the stage, and like seven seven of these Pentecostals come up to me, and they all lay hands on me, and they're like, <laughs> they're all praying over me in tongues, and go, right. just, oh, 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 trying to get me to like, receive the Holy Ghost according to their understanding. And and I'm like, I'm just like, I'm just a backslid Catholic boy. I'm like, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> Catholic boy. I, a very backslid Catholic boy. This is like from another, this is like more than from another, the whole thing is from another planet. But this, this whole thing with all these people with their hands on me, uh, you know, babbling over me and trying to get me to babble with them. I'm like, I need to get out of here. And yeah, I just, I'm out of here, yeah. I say, yeah I'll take up. Jesus, but you guys better stay here. <laughs> yeah, I, I jumped up and I ran out of the auditorium. I was like, this is just too weird. I can't handle this. And, uh, you know, my my own brain reasserted it. And my common sense, I should say, reasserted itself. <laughs> and I ran out of the auditorium and I go out to my car and my two friends are out there in the car because, you know, I had the keys and we're going anywhere <laughs> without me. And... I open the door and they're like, what happened to you? <laughs> they always called me by my last name. What happened to you, Alexander? I was like, man, I have, I don't know. What was that? And they're like, oh, don't worry about it. here. And they hand me a joint. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> and it's like, like that was my church and that was my sacrament. And it's it's like there were some people in that crowd, even in that those seven people that came up and laid hands on me and prayed for me, that were young people that were from the same high school I was from, Olympia High School, 1,200 students in 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, 1,200 students. And they were part of the the uh, Assemblies of God Church. They knew who I was, but no nobody, nobody followed up on me or anything. So I spent I spent weeks trying to process this. And I and uh, my little circle of druggy friends, I was like a royal pain in the butt for like the next month and a half because we'd be like, you know, hanging out, getting stoned or drinking or something. And I'd be like, man, what's this Jesus stuff? And they'd be, oh, Alexander, just shut up here. <laughs> and it, that went on for six weeks. And then finally, I just kind of pushed it all out. But from then on, I was like, man, this Christianity stuff, you got to be careful. This is like really strange. Okay, so a few years later, then you were then, you were really convicted. Yeah. So I, I went right on doing what I was doing, but worse. And I just became between 16 and 21. I just got worse. I just kept drinking and drugging. And then when I was 18 or 19, I kind of cleaned that up. But I was just very, very confused and troubled had a huge load, load of guilt and bitterness, cynical, didn't believe in any, anything, even though I had that religious experience of being born again and asking Jesus into my heart, coming under the conviction of sin. It, it It's like, it didn't change. It didn't change who I was, you know? Uh, and I, I don't know how to how to understand that, but all I know is that that by the time I was 21, I I didn't believe in God. I, I would have said I didn't believe in God when we walked into that auditorium. And then I had that experience and I spent six weeks oh, not 
wrestling with what had happened and then went back to not believing in God for five years. So I didn't believe in God. I didn't believe in anything. I hated myself. I hated the world. I was, I was what, what in the druggy culture you called a burnout. Yeah. You were spaced out. I was spaced out. I was, a, I was a burnout. Yeah. And then I run into a group of evangelical Christians again in my hometown of Olympia. And once again, they, uh, challenge me with the atonement they, they start talking to me about jesus dying for my sins and and how my guilt put him on that cross and how much he loves me and god loved so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life and once again to my amazement it's like i'm just i'm cut to the heart i'm gobsmacked by this I, I was over at the house of one of these evangelical Christians, and I end up just s sobbing with my head in my hands on the kitchen table and uh, basically saying just what you hear the disciples said on the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts chapter 2. They're like, men and brethren, what what must we do? Right. And unfortunately, they didn't say you must repent and be baptized. <laughs> they were like, pray this prayer. So once again, I'm like, Jesus, please come into my heart to be my Lord and Savior and forgive me my sins. But I mean, I'm I'm like sobbing. I'm like, I really meant it. And and Heavenly Father, he, he works with people where they're at, you know. And uh, I had a tremendous release of my guilt and my bitterness. And, but this time it took in the sense that I realized because of what I'd been through since I was 13 to 21, I'm like, I don't understand it, but this, this, the power that's in the, in the death of Christ, I didn't really have these words, but the power, the power that's in Jesus can actually change me and save me. And I need to be saved because if, if, I don't turn around. I'm going to be dead or in prison within a few years. Do you know? And so, and then the other thing was, is I realized this book they were reading out of, once again, they were reading about the atonement out of the gospel of John. I was like, I got to get my hands on one of those. That thing is true. There's power in the word of God and it's true. And it's like the penny dropped with regards to that. And, and so I grabbed a hold of a Bible. I got a Bible, King James Version, and I just devoured that thing. I devoured that thing like a starving man. And um, you like I, to read, right? You like to read. Yeah, I'm a reader. Yeah, I'm a reader. But I mean, if you can read something that's life changing and you're already a reader, of course, <laughs> you know, you're going to read. So, I, I've told this story before. I could tell this part of the story for you. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and tell this part of the story? Well, you read in the Bible about men and brethren, what shall we do? And they said, repent and be baptized and receive the Holy Ghost. And then that very day, 3,000 were added to this group. And you, anyway, you said, why? Went back to those people and said, why yeah. didn't you baptize me? Right? Actually, that that's close. <laughs> the general idea is right that that's in Acts chapter two, but I missed it at that point. But when I got to Romans chapter six, mm -hmm. what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Don't you know that as many of us as have been baptized into Christ right. Jesus have been baptized into his death? Mm -hmm. Therefore, we're buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. And I'm like, why didn't they baptize me? And I ran back to them and I, I showed them. I said, look, Romans 6, as many as are baptized into him can walk in unison. Why didn't you baptize me? And they were like, uh, well, baptism doesn't save anybody. I mean, if you insist, we could baptize you. I mean, really? I'm like, <laughs> oh, what do you mean, really? baptized me and they took me down to capitol lake in the middle of olympia washington and dunked me but of course they didn't even they didn't believe that you act they didn't believe in baptism they didn't have any priesthood authority to baptize me they didn't have a real church that was 
a city that has foundations to baptize me into, <laughs> you know. You got wet. I got wet. <laughs> That's it. I got wet. But I was on fire. Right. It, it lit a fire in my heart. I was like, man, Jesus is real. He really died for our sins. God really loves us. He proved it by sending his son. Everybody needs to know about I I mean, I got excited. The word of God is true. And and um, so I had become an evangelical Christian. And and that experience, the, the second experience, that this is if you start from when I was 16, it's 52 years, but if you start from when I was 21, it was 47 before I found the true church. But my experience of uh, I on June 10th, 1976 was when I broke down crying and gave my life to Jesus, realized the word of God was true. And three or four days later, I'm back saying, why didn't you baptize me? So this was maybe June 14th, 1976. I got wet. Okay. Mm -hmm. But from then on, so you're talking the summer of 1976 and essentially I was an evangelical Christian, a Bible believing evangelical Christian trained to, you know, the Bible's our rule, our only rule of faith and practice. Jesus is coming soon. We have to preach the gospel into all the world. Christ died for our sins. Everybody ought to know. So I just want to interject here that at that on that date in 1976, I had went on a mission for the LDS church. I, I dated Debbie before that in 68. We broke up. I went on a mission. I got married. So in 76, I was just barely married. Debbie uh, married in 70, I think, and had 69. In 69. And she, by that time, had three or four kids, or I don't know how many <laughs> kids she had. But um, anyway, that's what we were doing. We were not hippies anymore. We were, we had both were born and raised in the LDS church. So, um, we didn't we were able to get out of the hippie thing and and go on with our lives but that's that's where i was at you know and we were at and and that during that period of time the all over the united states from set from the early 70s into 76 the charismatic movement was moving into almost every denomination that there was and and taking over bits and pieces of the the christian world um, and so that was, it was very prevalent during that period of time. So, well, you had the, the whole Jesus movement exploded right in the early seventies. And then by the mid seventies, it was still growing, st going strong. Right. And, uh, the, these were Jesus movement, evangelical Christians that I had run into in my hometown. And so, you know, that, that whole thing, like you said, and, and about the same time, my mom starts going to this Catholic charismatic prayer group where right. she gives her life to Jesus and <laughs> receives the Holy Ghost and speaks in tongues. So all of a sudden I have a Pentecostal Catholic born again mother, you know, who's still, even though she's still willing to use the hairbrush if she can get me to sit still long enough, you know, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Well, you so, went on quite a journey then for many, many years and uh, exactly. found I mean, groups that you I am. stayed with. Mm -hmm. my, my, my destiny is kind of set for a long time in that I'm this deeply convinced, really fervent evangelical Christian who wants to go into all the world and preach the gospel. I believe the Bible is the only rule of faith and practice. I'm totally on board with sola scriptura and um, just, I don't want to just sit in a pew somewhere. I want to be a wholehearted disciple and, uh, and also I'm already a misfit because it's like, you know, this whole idea of scripture sola. See, I had no idea what I was getting into because the fact is, I just thought I was so naive. I was like, yeah, we're all Bible believing Christians. I thought we all would all believe the same thing because we all believe the same book, Do you know? But then I, I find out four days in, that here's these Bible-believing Christians that even though Romans 6 says what it says, they, they just don't even think baptism is part of the program. It's something that you, you it's like an optional add-on that maybe once you've been saved and asked Jesus into your heart, 
sometime down the road, you might decide to make a public profession of your faith and follow the Lord's example by getting publicly baptized in some church somewhere. But they did not see it as part of the plan of salvation at all. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so I'm already, and most of evangelical Christianity sees it this way. Not all. There's groups and large, you know, there's large numbers of groups in evangelical Christianity that believe all sorts of stuff, because there's 40, 44,000 different evangelical, charismatic, and Pentecostal groups. So, like, like if it, there's 44,000, there might be a thousand that, if you were go, wanted to to uh, become a Christian, they would tell you to repent and be baptized. You know, the, the other 43,000 might say, okay, pray this prayer, you know, but still in in any case i thought we would all agree the same have the same teaching and understanding of things because we were all reading the same book which was really naive of me and i very quickly starting four days in i very quickly find out that there's there is a unity there in that the vast majority of all the sincere Christians that I met love so, Jesus. So over, I, those, over those periods of time, you went to different churches. And what you told me is that there were even a few churches that you started your own stuff on your own. That was that much you, later. That was right. Yeah. But I mean, you're going to these different churches throughout this 46 right. year, however many year it is, you know. Yeah. The, these Jesus people had had started a little kind of a communal. Uh, Jesus people house on one of the main streets of my hometown. They called it the house of mercy. And this was a group that was headed up by a, a former assemblies of God pastor. So their understanding of the Bible was entirely Pentecostal assemblies of God, but it was based out of Eureka, California. And they had this little Jesus people communal house. And, and I went back to these people, and then after they baptized me, I was like, hey, can I move in with you? And they were like, sure. So I move in with these people. and uh, But but they were what I guess you'd call a parachurch organization in the sense that they weren't really trying to be a full-on church at that time. Later on, they developed into their own denomination, which is called the Gospel Outreach Reformational Churches. And there's only there's only about six of them, but that's that's the <laughs> denomination that, that came out of them. But uh, and they're Calvinists to the bone now, but they weren't mm. they weren't Calvinists back then. Uh, but uh, so for two years, I was part of this group, and um, and, they, and it, they all lived together in that. They, they all house. we all lived together in this house, but. Mm -hmm. We, we had our, our every, every Sunday, we went out and visited different churches. So for two years, every Sunday, you know, we go to the first Baptist, and then, then we go to the second Baptist, then we go to the, the third Pentecostal, then we go to the, the Presbyterian church, then we go to the Methodist church, and we, we visited churches all over Olympia for two years. So, you know, I'm exposed to all these different things. And well, were they trying to find a church they wanted to be a part of or what? They weren't trying to find a church they wanted to be a part of. They just they just wanted to uh, build the unity of the body of Christ. This was their mm. perspective. And so they wanted to, I don't know, I guess you'd say be peacemakers and and give the people that were involved in their little group an understanding of the variety that was out there in the different churches. Well, and, so you didn't have a church to meet in either, right? You didn't no, have we didn't church. have we didn't have a church building, right? right? And so, this is the beginning of my exposure to a very wide variety of what's to be found in. And you know, I think at this point, I think I better just stop saying evangelical Christianity because, buddy, this is people in people in evangelical Christianity think they really have the the right or some authority or wisdom to judge what's evangelical and what's not. But I, I think I'd rather just say, you know, non-Latter-day Saint Christianity, which is, you know, how many of the 46,000 non-Latter-day Saint Christian churches are non-Latter-day Saint Christianity? All of them. All of them. Yeah. And I think it's it's pretty much inarguable. 
But the one thing I found, of course, is that generally speaking, wherever you want went, the sincere people loved Jesus and were thankful that Christ died for their sins. And they really wanted to, uh, to live a life worthy of his sacrifice in one way, shape, or form, according to whatever their particular theology and doctrine and faith and practice might be, which is great. But personally, I found it extremely frustrating because... Have you ever been like to, um, I'm trying to think of the name of it. Um, what, what are, what are some of the most popular food buffets? Um, <laughs> Chuck-a-rama. Yeah, Chuck-a-rama. Yeah. I was in Chuck-a-rama in St. George, man. That's a hoot. And then there was another good one, one, the golden <laughs> corral. Okay. Right. All right. right. If you can imagine if you took, Golden Corral and Chuckarama, and then can you think of any others? Um, the Chinese buffet. <laughs> okay, the, yeah. the Chinese buffet. You got the Chuckarama. You got the Golden Corral, and uh, the one that my dad always took us to when I was a boy. It was like two dollars and fifty cents. All you. It was the Royal Fork. You know? Oh, yeah. I remember I've, that I've too, seen yeah. Royal Forks. Yeah. Ooh, so, so you got the Royal Fork. You got the Chinese buffet. You got the Chuck Chuckarama. You got the Golden Corral. You put all those puppies in in one restaurant, and you've got the spread of all four of those outfits all together. <laughs> so you've got like you've got a thousand that choices. Now that that doesn't even begin to express the number of choices that are in non Latter Day Saint Christianity. But just to give you an idea of how nutty it is, and you know when I was growing up. I had a mom and dad and they're like, this is what you're going to eat. <laughs> and they determined what the diet was. And that was the diet of the Alexander family, <laughs> you know, and, and it was set in stone, man. Eat your lima beans. You yeah. Know? It that was how it like, was at our house too. Yeah. It, it's Whatever like, mom fixed. That's it. Oh, when we had succotash, I was like, Oh man, lima beans, oh, God. <laughs> you know, but in, in any case, what I'm trying to say is, if you can imagine being in this buffet where there's a thousand choices and you're just supposed to just wing it and pick whatever, you've got no guidance. And, you know, you, I end up, what I would end up doing is, because of the way I was raised, I just end up eating whatever was the highest value you're not going to get any bread in me in a buffet you know it's it's all of the the meat and the the high dollar stuff that i would cram myself with and then i'd find a way to cram a lot of the the soft serve ice cream in on top of it so in this but buffet it, in this buffet the lds church was not even on the menu yeah right? the L, the lds church is is in another state yeah it's yeah. not it's not even if people are thinking what can i choose from they're they're not even in the field of search they're not even in the buffet but you've got this buffet do you want to go to the first baptist second baptist third baptist fourth baptist fifth baptist do you want do you want the baptist pentecostals do you want the seventh day baptist do you want the free will baptist that i mean there's hundreds of yeah. baptist groups and and they vary from being really like, oh, well, yeah, uh, just believe in Jesus, you're fine. Or, you know, hardcore Calvinism. I mean, they're all over the shop, and they, it isn't like their doctrine is the same. They're all over the map. That's just the Baptists. That's one of hundreds of groups of groups of denominations. Well, there, was a, there, was a, there came a time when you decided that there were specific things that you wanted to find in the church in Christ's true church. Yeah. And that's why you sort of went from church to church looking for these specific aspects that would show up in Christ's yeah. true church. The, the, you know, it, it looks to me like to really lay this out and, and you all might like flee in terror at the thought of it. I think this is going to have to be a mini series. <laughs> Maybe. You know, like Shogun, you can't tell the whole story in, in one in one episode. You know, you'll wear people out. <laughs> but I, I'm barely even near 
what you talked about. I know. I keep it, trying to bring you along, but I, I know you're <laughs> doing a good job. You're doing a good job. It's just, you know what? This is the beginning and the end. This is the beginning word and the last word of me talking about my past. So the way I am, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it like hair, teeth, and eyeballs. Okay, this is, <laughs> this is how I am. So you're going to get all the gory details. And you, you know what a lot of you know what a lot of my friends on the channel do? They listen to this stuff at four times speed. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm kidding, actually. But they, they listen to it at one and a half times speed. <laughs> if they listen to it, at... <laughs> they don't listen to it at four times speed. You can get through it faster. Yeah. Right? Okay, so I, I, I'm I'm with the I'm with in this group called Gastro Outreach. I'm there in Olympia, and I'm I'm already like really troubled, like like it. How are you supposed to know what to believe, and how then you should live? If you've got a thousand religious opinions that you're supposed to just pick from, I mean, what's up with that? It's like if if the result of the Bible only being your rule from faith and practice is this complete confusing free for all. I I mean, I what I'm just, did you do? Well, you do? I, I'm this is just the beginning of me being troubled about it. So anyway, this group Gospel Outreach they wanted to start a gospel outreach branch in Phoenix, Arizona. So I'm like, okay. And so I moved to Phoenix, Arizona as a single man and um, get there. And there's about 20 other people that have moved there to help start this gospel outreach group. And, you know, we read a little wedding chapel and actually start having our own little church meetings in this little wedding chapel. And I just start realizing, you know, I, I I think I need to get out of this little group and just see what's out there because it was just a tiny group and I just felt like I needed to see what's out there. So I left that gospel outreach group and I started attending a, and this was, this was a new thing for me. I'd never experienced this before in my life. I didn't even know they existed. Uh, a mega church. There was this mega church in Phoenix, Arizona called the Valley Cathedral. And, uh, you know, a mega church then, it, it, like now, some mega churches are 30,000 people. Okay. But back then, 3,000 was a big church. And it was a, a charismatic, so called non denominational. And non -denom I realized very quickly that what non denominational meant was that they would welcome people to c convert to their church. From any take other their money. They, take they, their money. If you were Catholic and you wanted to stop being Catholic and come to the Valley Cathedral and put in your tithe, they go, yay, yay. We're, we're non-denominational. If you were Methodist, if you were if you were somebody who was from the Assemblies of God, a denominational charismatic church, many of which are large mega churches, but you came to the Valley Cathedral, they, they'd welcome anybody. That's all. They, did, they didn't make them join it or do anything well they just... did they did have church membership most most churches most of these they have church membership how did they become a member you normally you go through classes and they explain to you what their particular take on things is and you agree and they then they explain to you that you know if you're going to be a faithful member you're supposed to tithe and you'd say okay i'm going to tithe and i agree with the, your your doctrine about this and this and that and uh, you become you go on the membership rolls so most of these churches, they have some form of church membership. And uh, so I'm attending, I start attending this Valley Cathedral thing. And uh, it was a hoot. It was like, you know, it was exciting, you know, like they had a, a youth group that had 10 times as many young people in it as were in the whole little gospel outreach church that I had come there to Phoenix to participate in. Um, and, uh, you know, they had a singles group, they had youth groups, they, these mega churches, they have something for everybody. If, if you want to be, you know, uh, hell's angels for Jesus, they'll have a hell's angels for Jesus chapter. If you want to be, if, if you want to, to start, uh, a, uh, a Valley Cathedral rock band for Jesus, they'll have a Valley Cathedral rock band, <laughs> you, you know, and, uh, th this, I kind of like this for a while. And I actually started attending the singles group and I met a young woman there 
Yeah, Good. One, I was going to say, don't leave out your yeah. getting married and things. One, this one time. of their one of their swim parties. Uh, there was this young woman there named Glorine, and I, I was like, well, she's she's nice. And somehow she thought I was nice. She thought I was weird, which I am. <laughs> but, but she also thought I was nice. And, uh, you know, we actually ended up getting married. And, um, the, 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 but then, then I, I get extremely, we're going to Valley Cathedral and think, okay, now they're just going to be happy. Non-denominational mega church, uh, Valley Cathedral people, and everything's going to be hunky dory. Well, this is this is distasteful to, to even talk about but now we're young marrieds and we're uh made aware that they have a series of classes for young married couples and this is such a big church i mean you know their young marrieds classes i don't know they're probably a hundred people they're probably 50 young couples in there okay and the associate pastor is up front and he starts talking about sexual practices in marriage and specifically and in detail endorses certain perverted sexual practices that to me were just unspeakable. I mean, I, I don't wanna I don't wanna you know go into detail, but I was just like I just looked at Glorine, I was like, this is nuts. I'm out of here, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And, and and I just I just got up and walked out, and she got up and walked out with me. But uh, I I mean I realized there's no authority here. There is like it's like these people just come up with anything, and there's no basis for there's no accountability. There's no. I I just found the whole experience just absolutely shocking. And and so I I never went back to that church after that because this this is like the so and during while he's teaching this the pastor who is a very charismatic and wonderful speaker I mean he could just hold you entranced for forty five minutes and you know and then they had their their church's slogan was where the difference is the worship and and they would hire for like you know a hundred thousand dollars a year which was huge money back then this like absolutely top flight professional worship leader who had who had written well-known christian uh happening hymns and stuff and and he like he, he like you, you know the worship and everybody's like oh, you know and then he the, the pastor would go up there and preach and but the 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 chief pastor came in and checked in on this whole thing and i you know so i'm like what is going on here? What am I involved? What have I gotten myself involved in this? This Protestant Christianity is just there was no control. There was no authority. Well, there was no authority, and yeah. the Holy Ghost wasn't there. No. In 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 that young marriage class. And if the Holy Ghost isn't there when you're teaching young married people how to think, is it really there in the services where everybody's getting goosebumps from the incredible <laughs> worship music and 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 uh, having their emotions moved by an extremely gifted, charismatic orator. And I'm like, what I'm involved in, is this even of God? It, it's like, you know, it freaked me out, really. I mean, I was upset. I was very upset. And uh, so this happened many times in your journey. This kind of thing happened over and over again. But at that point, I made a decision, and this is a this is an interesting tangent. I made a decision. I'm like, well, at least you know, my mom loves Jesus, and she's Catholic, and I was raised Catholic, and I just thought it was a load of baloney. But this whole Catholic charismatic renewal thing was going on, and I was like, at least the Catholics claim they have apostolic authority there's there's okay. some sort of central authority teaching authority that that they're standing on i should check that i i really need to reinvestigate the catholic church and th this thought came to me and i decided to check it out so where we lived in north phoenix was fairly close to this uh catholic church called saint jerome's and uh, 
I managed to talk Laureen into coming there with, she's like, man, what have I done? She, <laughs> she just wanted to be a, a happy, simple um, Assemblies of God wife. And she thought that the Valley Cathedral was basically like Assemblies of God, but even though they weren't part of the denomination, that it was the same kind of thing. And now her husband is like completely freaked out and won't go near the place. And now he wants to go to the Catholic church. You know, this was like, God bless her, you know. I, you know, she had to put up with a lot, but we go to this St. Jerome's church and the place is like just bursting at the seams. And there's all these young people that just love Jesus. And there's this really charismatic speaking Catholic priest. And we go there and I'm like, man, this is like interesting. And um, so I, we end up going to that church for a year. And then I decide I need to go there was one of the Catholic colleges, uh, a Franciscan college called the Franciscan University of Steubenville in Steubenville, Ohio. And uh, they, they were essentially like one of the centers of the Catholic charismatic renewal movement. And all of the Catholic parents that were, you know, born again Catholics and evangel evangelistic Catholics would send their their young people there to go to college because they knew that maybe they'd actually get born again and, you know, become care, just buy into the whole thing. Uh, this is the late seventies. This Early. would have been, uh, by now, I mean, we had been in Phoenix there. I, I was with those people in Olympia from 76 to 78. Yeah. And then in, in 78, I went to, to Phoenix to help them start a branch of gospel outreach. Oh. And then after about six months or a year, I quit, went to the Valley Cathedral, went to the Valley Cathedral. You're, you're at about 1980. Right. And then, uh, you know, we were going to St. Jerome's in 1981 was I think when I left the Valley Cathedral and then we're going to um uh, uh, St. Jerome's actually it might have been more for more than a year it was after a year I started investigating this whole thing with the Franciscan University going there and and studying at the university and uh, we actually ended up moving there in 1984 okay, okay. moving to Ohio to Steubenville Ohio and of course, my wife's not Catholic, but I'm trying to be Catholic uh, because at least I know there isn't going to be something coming out of left field like it happened. You know, to me, I'm like, well, at least this More organized. Yeah. yeah. So I move there and I start going to this uh, Catholic university, this Franciscan University of Steubenville, and I realize. I just come to the realization that that the that the apostolic authority that I was hoping the Catholic Church still had really was defunct. And um I I just didn't really find it believable, you know. And and you know, I could outline the reasons for that, but all you have to do is study history. Well, it sounds like you like specifics. You like to look into things. You like to check on things and, you know, everything is not just a leap of faith. You like to study things out and find, uh, you know, well, what you're looking for. My, my, pa my pattern. Yeah. I would, I mean, the scripture says test all things, hold fast to that, right. which is good. You know, it says judge the tree by its fruit. It says there's many false prophets and wolves in sheep's clothing. You know them by their fruit. And and really a huge part of, of what was driving me is I really wanted to be a holy man. And I really wanted, it, it's like I would read my Bible and I would see all these things in the Bible. And one of the main things I saw that was that you, in order to have, like, what does it say in Ephesians 4? It says something like, uh, it says, with all lowliness and meekness, bearing with one another in love, endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. For there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who's above all and in all and through you all. And it's like, 
and then the, the prayer of Christ in John 17, I'm like, there has to be genuine apostolic and prophetic leadership. If you read Acts 15, and it, that without apostles, and, and from what Jesus said, I start noticing what Jesus says throughout the Gospels when he says, look, he who receives, he says of his apostles, he who receives you receives me. And he who receives me, receives him who sent me. He who rejects you, rejects me, and rejects him who sent me. He says this in three or four different places in the four Gospels. And so as far as I know, I've received Jesus. I asked Jesus into my heart. I've received Jesus, haven't I? But according to what Jesus says, I'm, and this, I still feel like I don't have anything solid to stand on. I basically... I'm not sure what to believe and what not to believe and how I should live and how I should not live. You, you probably have ran into the, the LDS missionaries too, at some point in your journey, those guys with the white shirts and ties and little name tags, you know, you probably at, ran into a few of those along the line, but you didn't really listen to them. At that point, at that point, I actually hadn't. Oh, you hadn't? Okay. I, I don't have any memory of having run into the latter days. I would, of course, you see them. I would, I never saw sister missionaries. I didn't know such mm -hmm. a creature existed until, until I met a with year them. ago. Yeah. Yeah. A little over a year ago. Mm -hmm. But I would see the elders riding right. around on their bicycles. Right. Of course, everybody sees that. If you live in the United States, you're going to see it. But I don't recall ever having a conversation with them. But I already had, just from being in evangelical Christianity, the monolithic view of the Latter-day Saints was that they're, they're just this evil cult. Somehow somehow the people seem nice, but they're deceived. They're not saved. They're going to hell. They don't have the right Jesus. Their Jesus is a demon. Their God's a demon. They do all this weird stuff. They have these weird temples that they do weird stuff in. They're just, they're not even, they're not part of the buffet. You know, this giant buffet? Right you're supposed to like somehow have wisdom from God to choose the right food from those 44, 46,000 different items in the buffet. And you're supposed to pick the right ones. And, and God's going to tell you how to pick the right ones. But then you find out that everybody else, everybody's picking something different. And, and so, so you read, plus when you were a kid, you read those stories about the Mormons. Gonna say, right? Sherlock that's, Holmes was that's what, you what first I was going to say. <laughs> so without ever really encountering the missionaries personally, I had encountered an authoritative voice that told me what the Mormons were in the works of Sherlock Holmes in his right. short novel, A Study in Scarlet, where they're white slavers and assassins who are trying to right. kidnap beautiful young women to incorporate them into the harems of the leaders in in the salt lake valley and they're going all the way over right. to england to do this and sherlock holmes has to outwit them and and yeah. sherlock holmes yeah. is the it's for me when i was a boy sherlock holmes was the urim and the thummim i mean he was the arbiter of truth he would come into right. a situation where where the evil was was being hidden and being gotten away with, and he would expose the truth about it. And the truth of the Mormons that he exposed was what I just said, which is an absolute lie from hell. But I probably read a study in Scarlet six times between the ages of six and 12. So I become an evangelical Christian, and people are like, yeah, the Mormons, man, they're just, that's just evil. And I'm like, yeah. We, all three of us grew up in what I would call the mission field or whatever you want to call it. Uh, you know, we were all, you were from, we we're all three from Washington state, but if you would have been in Idaho or Utah, you probably yeah. would have ran into more Mormons. But, um, I was like you, I had two, two, there was four LDS students in my high school and that was it. And probably similar with Debbie in Moses Lake, Washington. So, uh, you don't that. really run into, yeah. you run into more, uh, of these other churches and you do the LDS church. So, well, that, that was the case. I mean, I, to my knowledge, I never, I'm sure I did meet Mormons or go to school with, but yeah. I never knew that they were Mormons. I, I, I never, the only Mormons I knew were the ones that I saw in a study in Scarlet in Sherlock Holmes book and really the, knew in those evangelical too. Christianity. And everybody is saying 
that the Mormons aren't even part of the buffet. You can't choose. Right. You can't choose from that restaurant. That restaurant is what they serve is poison. It will kill you and take you to hell. That's not part of the 46,000 item. So you kept going around the buffet, sampling the different yeah. food items. <laughs> well, at, at this point, at this point, I was, uh, Glorine and I, you know, we've been popping out kids. At this point, we had like two children, and then we, we have another one on the way. I build this little house out on an old uh, uh, dairy farm with a collapsed barn. And the person that sold it to me had already built the basement of the house. So I just had to like finish it. The foundation was done. And uh, we're living in this little house. And uh, at this point, I'm like, I don't know what to do. I'm not really sure what to believe. And all I know is that it's like the only thing I knew, you know what? The only thing I knew then was the same thing I knew a day after I gave my life to Jesus when I was 21. And that's all I knew for certain the day that it came into my heart that I had to call those sister missionaries, if you can believe that. Right. When you have 46,000 different sets of faith and practice and doctrine and an infinite number of religious opinions that are just competing with each other as a smorgasbord, and people are just like, well, I think I'll take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of this, but there's no... There is no central teaching authority. There's no apostolic and prophetic authority that actually has genuine priesthood authority to say, okay, this is this is the faith of the Church of Jesus Christ. One and of the things that you have shown me as I've been watching your videos, I... I was on a mission in Central California, so we came across, and I went to a lot of these different churches, and I grew up in the Mormon church, and I did not know about any of these other churches, so what, from watching you talk about your journey through these different churches, I've come to realize that uh, there's a big influence on people getting caught outside of the church, and really not even wanting to look into the church or even care about looking into the church. And uh, it's, it's really funny that they all say that they're Christians except for the Mormons or except for the Seventh-day Adventists or except for this church or that church. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it seems like you were in the movement, but uh, you <laughs> just were keep being kept away from it. So, yeah. Yeah. No, what do you mean when you say it seems like I was in the movement? Well, no, I mean you were in the oh, you were in the Christian movement of the overall charismatic Protestant, whatever you want to right. call it. Sure. In that in that, in that Christian movement. Yeah. But when I was like on my mission, I was talking to people, they'd say, Well, your church is a cult, or yeah. the 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 Seventh day Adventist is a cult, or the Jehovah's Witnesses are a cult. Yeah. And um you know, so there's a plethora of anti-Mormon literature. I mean, if you want to learn about the Mormon church, someone's going to hand you a whole handful of pamphlets and videos and all kinds of different things to really tell you what it's like. But yeah, that that's true. And, and uh, to some extent, I was exposed to that because it was just part of the evangelical culture of the day. Right. Like if, if you were assembling a library as an evangelical Christian, of course, you were familiar with Walter Martin and uh, the Kingdom of the Cults, which is his right. magnum opus, his basically encyclopedia of the cults of which the Mormons hold the pride of place. I think it's right at the beginning <laughs> of the Kingdom of the Cults and has the largest section. And then, of course, you'd probably have a, a couple of Walter Martin's cassette tape series and, you know, things of this sort. And maybe you go see uh, the Godmakers if it came through town. And, and this was just part of the culture. Um, but at this point, I've experienced, like I visited all these churches when I was in my hometown of Olympia. 
I've been part of an attempted church plant, which did not work. It ended up falling apart in Phoenix, Arizona. What's Got a church a, plant? A church plant is where, see, that's that's evangelical language. You plant a church. You, you start your own church. And it, this happens in the LDS in the sense that they decide they start it as a branch and then it becomes a ward, right? And right. It, it's the same kind of thing. Basically, you go someplace where where there isn't a church of the sort you think is best, you know, the the plate from the buffet that you agree with is the best food. And there's a particular town where there isn't any, nobody's serving that particular plate of food. And you think that's the right plate of food because that's the one that you chose. Mm. And so you start a little church or you go there and, and maybe you're sent by a group or you can do it just as an individual, which I did three different times. And I, I'm just about to get to that. And I think we'll conclude episode one of Shogun with, with this <laughs> because we don't, want to wear, Shogun. <laughs> we don't want to wear people out. But uh, and and you just you you find a church building that someone else will let you use or you rent a space. It's very popular. A lot of churches, they start like a, they'll they'll rent like a uh the cafeteria hall at a, the local elementary school, uh, all sorts of things. Or, you know, you start a Bible study in your home and you you attract and and develop a, what becomes a core group of a church from a Bible study in your home until uh, you have the resources from people deciding this is something they really want to participate in and they start tithing. And then you go and you have the resources to rent uh a space somewhere to actually have your church meetings on a regular basis. But um, I, I forget where I was going. Well, with you that. were at the cat, you were on your ranch yeah. in, in Iowa or wherever you were at, and you were getting disgruntled with the Catholic church. And no, you I'm not on a ranch. Get... Where do you, where do you find me on a ranch? This I property you built building your a house. house. You built oh, a house. Yeah. I'm on, and I have that six acre. What was the center of an old dairy farm? right dairy and, uh, farm sorry no that's okay yeah and and i've i checked out all these churches in my hometown of olympia i experienced the the pentecostal uh gave my life to jesus at 16 gave my life to jesus again at 21 and and then go out to start a new branch of gospel outreach like this this kind of uh parachurch a uh, group that is very closely connected to this former Assemblies of God pastor, then leave that behind, go to this huge mega church, uh, get disgusted in the young marriage class, write that off. Oh, I forgot the, the, the youth pastor there. And this is what happens. I stopped going there shortly after that. The, the, uh, the singles pastor, Glenn Milo and his wife, they leave the church and take most of the singles group with them to start their own little church. Right. Yeah. Okay. And so my wife and I went there for a while, but this is what happens all the time. You know, it's, it's over money, salary, power, control, not just over doctrine. All right. Uh, and so, so Glenn, you know, he, he was uh, not getting paid or hardly getting paid. And he's like, you know, if I can just all, all these single people that, that think I'm great, you know, I can start my own church and then, you know, then I can, uh, I can, make a living at this and so, <laughs> you know life. i know this is strange this is strange thinking. Luker. this is strange <laughs> thinking for latter-day saints but this is this is how it went and and then you know i'm i reinvestigate my catholic roots at saint jerome's and then i decide to go to the franciscan university of steubenville i go there about a year after i get there i'm like no this catholic stuff is not going to work i do not believe that that the authority of the kingdom of God is in the Roman Catholic Church. I can't buy that. There has to be authority somewhere. There has to be living apostles and prophets somewhere, but I don't believe they're there. And and uh, so I'm out there. And while I'm out there living in this little tiny town outside of Steubenville, there, there's a uh, an evangelical Presbyterian church, faith evangelical Presbyterian church. So I, we start attending that a bit. And um, where the Faith Evangelical Presbyterian Church came from was the Presbyterian Church in this little town of about a thousand people uh, split because the the Presbyterian Church had started ordaining 
people, women. not not just women, uh, pe people who were uh, same sex sexual oh. orientation, and and so yeah. and so the conservative people of this little town are like, this is not right. We can't be part of this denomination anymore, and so the Evangelical Presbyterian Church came into existence as a denomination precisely because of that. And this has happened to virtually all of the mainline Protestant churches uh, have experienced other denominations, you know, half of half of their membership leaving and forming another denomination that, that holds on to a more socially conservative view of, you know, gender, of, uh, you know, sexual practices of all these kinds of things. And and so and we're then you met the Mormon missionaries. No, I still didn't meet the Mormon missionaries. No? Oh, at no? this point, and this is I'm I'm winding this up, but at this point, I'm gonna wind it up with my first the the, the first church I start myself. <laughs> because by now, yeah, I mean you can see I've had quite a bit of experience. Oh yeah. And to me, it's just it's just a confusing mess. But the only thing I really know is that. There is a God. He loves everybody. He sent his son, Jesus, to die for people, and they need to know that. And the Bible's and, true. And the Bible's true. <laughs> so this, this is basically, this is my toolbox. That's all I've got in my toolbox. Everything else, it's really clear to me. Well, you know, this is that person's plate of food from the 46,000 dish buffet, and this, another person. Basically, there's all these religious opinions, but to me, that wasn't opinion. That was like, that was the only thing solid I had. The Bible's true. Uh, there is a God. He really loves us. He proved it by sending his only son, Jesus, to die for us when we were yet sinners. It's precisely in this that God proves his love for us, that where we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And people need to know about it. This, this was all I knew, okay? I, and I, I realized that was all I knew. <clears throat> At that point, uh, my family and I, we, I rent a, uh, a recreational vehicle and go on vacation to Tucson, Arizona. That and sounds while, familiar. <laughs> while I'm out in Tucson, Arizona, I visit this church out there, which is another denominational expression that came out of the Jesus movement. A, a denom a, a, this huge church is, I don't know, about 1,500 people. It was called the Door Christian Fellowship. And this had come out of a former four-square gospel, which is one of countless Pentecostal denominations, a four-square gospel pastor that had started preaching the gospel, and a bunch of hippies and freaks had become believers, and then he started sending them out to start churches and ended up separating from the four-square denomination and essentially starting his own denomination, which is called the Christian Fellowship Churches. But the, the fellow that had pastored this, that, that was the pastor there, this fascinated me. I can't remember his name. I could look it up, but he's still the pastor there as far as I know. But he had been sent out by Wayland, Wayman Mitchell from Prescott, Arizona, to pioneer a church in Tucson. And on the way, had gotten in a car wreck and was paralyzed from the waist down. Oh, man. Okay. Uh, Harold, Harold Warner, I think was his name. Harold Warner. And he was like 21 or something. He was like 21, 22 years old, you know, married, mm -hmm. married young man. And um, when he finally got out of the hospital in a wheelchair, paralyzed from the waist down, he's like, okay, I'm going to Tucson. And everybody was like, what? And he's like, well, you know, you sent me to Tucson to start a church. I'm going to Tucson to start a church. This isn't going to stop me. See, you see this kind of thing. I'm like, good on him. You know, <laughs> it's hard not to admire that. He goes there in a wheelchair and he started this church about, I don't know, 20 years earlier. And now there's like 1,500 people in it. And he had sent out many, many other people to start many other churches all over the world. And I was like, I was like, man, he's paralyzed and waist down. If he can do that, I can do that. <laughs> so I come home, I come home from my vacation. And um, I had been feeling, I know this is, this is going to sound wacky to a lot of Latter-day Saints, but see, all I had was the Bible. I didn't, the only thing solid I had other than knowing that there was a God and he loved me and he sent his son to die for me was that the Bible was true. 
So about the only way I could express my faith and my love for God and for Jesus was by doing my best to keep the commandments of Christ that I saw in the Gospels. And one of the things that I saw in the Gospels was Jesus says, look, don't lay up. This is in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6, he says, do not lay up treasure on earth where moth and rust corrode and thieves break through and steal. Lay up treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not corrode and thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You cannot serve both God and money. You'll hate the one, love the other, be devoted to one, despise the other. And uh, just consider the lilies of the field. You know, all that that beautiful passage, they so, you know, Consider the birds of the air. They sow not, neither do they reap. And and so I'm like, I had been feeling quite troubled because I I was uh, I had become like successful in small business, and I had all my ducks in a row in terms of pursuing financial security. Uh, you know, I had silver, I had gold, I I had investments. I had stocks, I had bonds, I had a thousand shares of Apple stock. Okay. And, <laughs> yeah. And uh, like in, in, uh, in Luke chapter 12, uh, chapter 12, Jesus specifically says, fear not little flock. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And and I had been fighting against that. I'd just been telling myself for years, well, it's okay to, I, I, I got to be responsible, man. I got to be prepared. For, how can I not have a 401k and stocks and bonds and silver? I have to have all this stuff. But what I had found as I was building my portfolio was that what Jesus says, what I told myself, it's okay to have treasure as long as your heart's not in it. But that's not what Jesus says. He says, where you where your treasure is, there your heart will right. be. Yeah. And I, I found this was entirely true. I, like I'd wake up in the morning and I couldn't rest until I found out what silver was doing. Or, or you know, I'd come home from work and I'm like, man, where's Apple stock at? And you couldn't just look at your iPhone to find this stuff out. You know, it's like, you know, when you're trying to heap up riches, you're obsessed with trying to heap up riches and to whatever extent you've succeeded in doing it, then you're you're like, I got to make sure I hold on to this and that it's increasing and not decreasing. Or find a newspaper. Yeah, exactly. So in any case, I'm like, I can't do this. I, I just need to sell all this stuff, liquidate it at all, and, and start some ministry trying to reach people for Jesus in this little town of Wintersville, which is about five, 10 minutes away. And uh, amazingly, you know, Glorian goes along with this, bless her heart, uh, you know. <laughs> uh, and so I, I cash everything in, and we we rent this uh, we rent this uh, commercial space in this strip mall, and actually put up like a you know a neon sign, the Door Christian Fellowship, just imitating this character down in Tucson. And, uh, you know, furnish the place and and just start going. I, Glorine didn't do this. She was home with the children. You know, she was like, well, this is your thing. But, you know, I know I know you're going to take care of us. So what am I going to do? You know, and and so anyway, I I'm going out and I'm just trying to tell people about Jesus and, you, you know, trying to reach out to people that are just really broken and needy and just help them know that God loves them. <laughs> And, you know, inviting them to come to church and all this. And I don't know if you've ever done like street level ministry with really broken people, but it it's really challenging work. As missionaries, we had to track and we had to talk to people and we, yeah. You know, yeah but, I mean, he's street, probably working but... with drug addicts and, the, right. and that is a hard, hard way. And, and I, the, the, where I was at, I was like, like, like I, th this is how crazy I took some of, some of what I had saved for retirement. I bought this three bedroom mobile home and put it behind my house out in the country, you know, on the center of this dairy farm thing. And so that here's this, here's this single mom that starts coming to the church. Who's just doesn't have two nickels to rub together. And she's got two boys and we're like, well, just come on out and move, move in behind us. You know, we're just basically trying to take care of people however we can. 
And um, after about a year of that, it, it just broke me because I mean, I was the blind leading the blind. I'm I'm trying to, I'm desperately trying to practice what I see in the scriptures to make a deep difference in the lives of other human beings that are just as screwed up as I am, maybe more, although that, that would have been hard to imagine. <laughs> oh, but in any case, trying to make a real difference in the lives of these people, just as an evangelical Christian going out and saying, Jesus loves you, man, you need to give your life to Christ. And um, at the end of a year, I was like completely worn out by it. And just probably your money was gone too. Well, I, yeah. Yeah. Most of it was, but uh, most of that went towards getting the ball rolling, you know, right. but once you got the, but no, you know, just the, the pressure of the whole thing. I did not have the authority to do what I was doing. Nobody, nobody had sent me, but if you're in a system that doesn't recognize the need for genuine apostolic and prophetic authority, if it doesn't exist, Basically, what you're left to do is you read the book, you try to sort out what you're supposed to do, and then you just do your best to do it on it's your own. Your interpretation of what you think the yeah. different scriptures mean. It's and of course, of course, you don't have to. You don't have to be such a such a. You don't have to be like I was. Most people. Most people find a way to fit into some sort of denominational structure where if they feel a burden to go into ministry, they go to, like, if you're assemblies of God, uh, you go to central Bible in Springfield. You were too uh, picky. Well, that, that's the thing. Like I actually considered, I, cause my wife was assemblies of God to the bone. Her grandparents were among the founding families of the assemblies of God. And and she was just assemblies of God right down to her DNA. And I'm like, well, you know, maybe I should just be assemblies of God. So I check into the assemblies of God and consider going to Central Bible to actually be trained to qualify as an assemblies of God minister. And what I find out is one of the, they call them distinctives, all right? One of the distinctives of the assemblies of God churches is that they're hair, teeth, and eyeballs behind this idea of this thing called the pre-tribulation rapture, that that at the end of the age, when there's this time of great trouble called Jacob's trouble, or Jesus calls it a time of tribulation in Matthew 24, such as the world has never seen before and will never see again, that because we're Christians and, you know, maybe because we're Americans too, but it, at least because we're Christians and God loves us, he's going to pull us off the earth before things get really difficult. And um, I just thought that was wacky. I mean, is God going to have to apologize to all the people that didn't get pulled off the earth, earth before things got That was got the really Left difficult? Behind movie. That was a Left yeah. Behind series. Yeah, the left, yeah. left Behind thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, what's the fellow that's behind cho The Chosen? Um, you yeah. Remember? We know. Dar Daryl or Darren or... Da anybody? Darren... Uh, his his father Jenkins right. his, Jenkins Jenkins yeah yeah his dad wrote those books yeah. his dad wrote those books and and made series off of it worldwide but this this is the perspective of a large part of charismatic and right you know Pentecostal Christianity is I this have thing to go. oh you have to go okay yeah <laughs> and it, can we wrap it up in five minutes or is that too yeah she has five minutes okay. Yeah. I, ha I, I have to leave in, in le less than 15 minutes. Less I have stuff I have to do before I leave. So. Okay, all right. <laughs> Let's just wrap. In any case, so here I am. Here I am. I tried to start my own church, but I didn't have the authority to do it. And uh, it crashes and burns after a year. And what am I going to do now? Okay. And so this is, this is, uh, what would this be? So at this point, it's like 1987. So this is the first 11 years, or if you count it from when I gave my life to Jesus at that revival at St. Martin's when I was 16 and stoned on mescaline, it would be the first 16 years of my journey 
but here I am in in uh, in Ohio, having tried to do something for God and having it be a a miserable failure, and I I don't know what to do next. And um, so this is part one of the really questionable mini series entitled <laughs> entitled what is it? Who is the real? Who is the real? The the true full story of who is the real David Alexander and what has he actually been doing for the past <laughs> half century, as if anybody should care. But in any case, for those people that actually think this matters, I hope you enjoyed this. And I, I really appreciate my friends uh, suffering along with me and, and bringing me along on this journey and helping me with this. And, uh, Hopefully in a few days, we'll be back. We'll be back.